Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Unex News Radio podcast, your news source for all things unexplained. And now, here's your host for the Unex News podcast, Margie Kay. Good evening and welcome to Unex News, where we talk about all things unexplained. I'm your host, Margie Kay, and I have a special guest with me this evening. But first, I want to mention a couple of things that you might be interested in, especially this time of year, since we're in October and around Halloween time. You might be interested in this book, Gateway to the Dead, a Ghost Hunter's Field Guide. And this is... Uh, obviously about ghost hunting, but from a psychic's perspective, and it gives all kinds of good techniques in it. And then I have this this one, Haunted Independence, Missouri. Boy, is this place haunted where I live. There is a lot going on here. Commercial buildings, houses, cemeteries, you name it. There's a lot happening, and it's in that book. Then my latest one, winged aliens and this is a theory that winged cryptid creatures are aliens and or interdimensional beings and that pretty much sums up the book but there's a lot in it and there are a lot of sightings i started receiving sighting reports of winged creatures and a lot of them were in conjunction with ufos this started in 2012 and so that's when i started on my quest to get answers to that subject and what these winged creatures were. And that's why I am particularly interested in the subject this evening that we're going to be talking about with Mike Cleland. Mike is considered an expert in the skills of ultralight backpacking and is the author and illustrator of a series of instructional books on advanced outdoor techniques. After 25 years living in the Rockies, he now lives in the Adirondacks. Mike's 2015 book, The Messengers, was met with high praise. In it, he explores the mysterious connection between owls, synchronicities, and UFO abduction. It was his firsthand experiences with these elusive events that have been the foundation for his research. This book is also a personal memoir and a journey of self-discovery. Welcome to the program, Mike. Oh, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, okay, there we go. Thank you so much. It's my honor to be here. It, it's great to have you. I read your book several years ago, and I was totally fascinated by it and, and absolutely could relate to many of the experiences people were having with owls and this connection with UFOs. Mike, how did you discover the, the connection? Uh, when did you first notice that there was something going on with owls? Well, it was more, not so much that I discovered the connection. It was the, sort of the connection discovered me. I kind of feel like uh, I had a camping, I uh, went on a camping trip in 2006 where uh, I was with a complete stranger, someone I had never met really before. And I, in our very first conversation, I said, I'll take you camping. And I did. And I was living in a town where there's lots of backpacking and camping. It's right next to Grand Teton National Park. And uh, we went out for one night. And uh, I've told this story many, many times, but uh, and it's hard to convey the power of this story. It's a very simple story, but wow, did it change the direction of my life. Uh, we went out for one night and I, uh, this woman was, we were, she was, she and I were talking and her name is Kristen. And she was saying something, it was really important. It really had a nice power to it. And I, I was kind of astonished. I was like, this is a smart woman. This is a powerfully smart woman. Very insightful. And then an owl flew over our head. And then another owl. And then a third owl. And for the next couple of hours, these three owls flew over us and landed near us and sat on branches near us. And uh, it was really powerful, really powerful. We, we slept out under the stars. And as we laid down, the owls would swoop down over our faces and they would blot the stars out for just one Wow. Amazing. We went out camping in a different spot four days later, and the same exact thing happened. Three owls at sunset, but this time they were much closer. 
they would land on the branch right next to us and they would swoop down almost touching us and they would land they were landing at our feet and when i first had that experience you know like this is 2006 and i did not talk about it then i started talking about it in my book and i and i heard a voice in my head that said this has something to do with the ufo's and i didn't quite know what that meant and in the aftermath i started looking into my own experiences and i had a number of ufo related experiences in my life that were really bothering me and i was pushing them away i was not going to go there i was going to i was denying all of it mm -hmm. i had missing time i had a close up ufo sighting i had um multiple ufo sightings and i had one event where i actually woke up in the middle of the night and sat up and looked out the window and there were five gray beings walking towards my house and wow I, and i heard a voice in my head that said this has something to do excuse me i heard a voice in my head that says oh yes they're here now is the time to put your head on the pillow and shut down and that's exactly what i did and it was in winter time and i dismissed it all as a dream and the next morning i didn't even bother to go out to see if there were footprints in the snow outside my window um so in the aftermath of all that i started asking the question i started looking into my own experiences it was like it was the experience with the owls that that forced me to, to look into my own what I now would consider UFO contact experiences. And I started reaching out to people and started talking to people. And, and because of the owl experiences, everyone I talked to, I would find a way to ask, have you ever had any odd experiences with owls? And it wasn't a hundred percent, but it was enough that there was a, um, there was a very clear pattern of people who had these weird, weird stories with owls. And I started collecting those stories and archiving those stories and, um, those, that collection of stories, well, a small percentage of them formed the first book, The Messengers. And, um, and, and I have been sort of studying the owl phenomena, which is a tiny, tiny little sliver of a much, much, much bigger overall subject. And, and so what's happened is I'm looking at this little teeny itty bitty fractal of a, of a giant subject and it is proving to be so rich and so rewarding and so interesting to me that i'm 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 amazed and astonished and i feel really honored to be to be the collector in the in the archivist for this kind of powerful information well you certainly are uh, you're known as the the owl man and i i think this was something that really needed to get out there because there are so many people that have had these experiences and they just don't know what to think of it. They, they don't know why they see an owl and it's larger than it should be. You know, I've, I've had some of the witnesses I've worked with or they talk about a three foot owl standing in the middle of the street and they have to stop their car and they're wondering what that thing is doing there. And then then the next thing they know, they've got missing time. Uh, and and so many where they think that they've seen, they're seeing an owl, but they know that it must be something else. Is this, do you have any idea at this point, are these screen memories or are they actual ETs that are, that are cloaking themselves as something else? What do you think that is? Well, there's, in my opinion, there's two things going on. So one is exactly the screen memory that you just brought up, that that four foot tall owl on the road or the three and a half foot tall owl on the road. They've got to stop their car. I, wow, I've heard that one a lot. You know, wow, that one shows up a lot. And then, um, you know, it also shows up, you know, four foot tall, four foot tall owls in um, their driveway or looking out their window or in their yard or sometimes at the foot of their bed. They'll have a four foot tall owl. I've heard that one more than once. So what we're dealing with in that case is the screen memory. So there's some sort of psychic projection being being implanted in the mind of the observer, where the where the um, what I would assume is a gray alien is somehow using energy or psychic means to cloud the perception of the viewer, and. Mm -hmm. And you'll often have missing time. You'll often have a UFO report. You'll often have a very unsettling set of emotions surrounding the event. 
so that's only that's in the book I, I talk about that and I try to move on from that because I think that's that's very much part of the overall story but there's there's something more there's uh, there's real owls showing up in the lives of people who have had contact experiences and I feel very certain that the owls that I saw in the mountains with Kristen were real owls they weren't a screen memory they were tiny they were just you know 10, 11 inches tall. They looked like owls. They were flying around like owls, but they were somehow in our little, they were attracted to me or to us, whatever the situation might be. So this is, I'm at the point now where I like take off my UFO investigator hat and I set it aside. And then I put on my shaman hat and I ask the questions that a shaman might ask if here, let's just, I'm going to use an analogy. Let's turn the clock back, you know, 500 years and a young Dakota Brave or Lakota Brave is, is walking down the path near his village and he has a powerful mystical experience with, a, with an owl, with a real owl. He could go to the village shaman and say, oh, you know, I, I just had this experience with an owl. Maybe the owl talked to him. Maybe there was some insight granted because of the owl maybe the owl was in conjunction with like a bright unusual light in the sky the shaman would ask what was going on in your life leading up to this you know mm. what changed after mm -hmm. so there's a totem animal aspect to the owls in the stories that i'm collecting now for my personal experience so what was leading up to my owl sighting undoubtedly i was in total complete denial about my ufo experiences Mm. I saw an owl, heard a voice in my head. The owl as messenger said, or it was a voice in my head. The owl didn't, its little beak didn't move and it didn't speak, but I sure heard the voice in my head while looking right at the owl. And I heard, this has something to do with UFOs. And then I, after in the aftermath, so what happened after my experiences, I started looking into my own experiences. And um, that proved to be, a very chaotic time in my life because it, a lot of stuff emerged. So, so when I say I take off my UFO investigator hat and put on my shaman hat, I mean that like, I'm really asking some more mystical type questions than, than just, you know, which direction did the UFO come from? I don't call the airports really to check and see if someone right. saw something. So I'm seeing the owl as a mystical totem animal that would, that would be connected to, um, to the life of the observer, the same way that in any other highly charged human event, there might be a, a totem animal that are, are appears uh, around death, around meditation, around some sort of initiatory, uh, like being initiated, actually being people being initiated into shamanism, becoming the village shaman. And there's real shamans out there. People are doing hard work oh, yeah. and good work. And I have heard from a lot of them. And it, it's my understanding that it is well understood within the community of shamans that owls show up around the time of the initiation, which is to me remarkable. You know, that, that totally makes sense to me because one of the things that, that I've observed is that, well, I'm a remote viewer and I am in telepathic contact with a lot of things. And I, I came to the idea that, we're talking about a level of consciousness. And when you reach a certain level, there are, are things that are triggered that will help you get over that hump. And it sounds like the owl connection is a part of that. What do you think? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I just, I talked about it where, you know, where I say like, um, the owl is, uh, is like a, is like an exclamation point in a sentence, right? So if you're the author of, and you want to, you want to uh, emphasize something, you just hit the key that has the the exclamation point, exclamation mark on it, right? So you've you've added emphasis to your sentence. So the, let's just say the authors of reality, like the, whatever grand matrix is unwinding and and filling our world with the reality that we see, if if the thing they can send in an owl the same way we hit the keyboard with the exclamation point now the owl is like that the, the, there's no consciousness in in my keyboard when i hit that 
that thing. There's there's a consciousness of the person hitting the key though. So I'm arguing that the owl is just a messenger. The owl isn't necessarily imbued with anything magical, but the 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 mystical force that put the owl, you know, on the windowsill of the UFO abductee when he was having a powerful spiritual experience at the same time. So I would argue that the that the owl itself is a little more neutral, but the but the but the mystical force of nature seems to have have a an intention. Does that make sense? It sure does. It absolutely does. And I people see other 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 winged creatures as well, like hawks. For instance, I had I was working on the book and I was concentrating on uh, Mothman and hawks and owls and you know other wing wing creatures and some things you can't even describe and one evening i left my office it was at dusk an owl came or i mean a hawk came towards my vehicle from uh, across the street so it, it flew quite quite a distance maybe 75 feet or more and as i got in my car it swooped down over the hood and down over my windshield. And I can't believe it didn't hit it and, and away. But I also heard a mechanical sound like a humming, like a motor. Have you ever had anybody that, you know, that you've worked with, with owls have something like that happen? Um, wow. You know, you're, you're describing something that's, not uncommon within the within the lore. So I don't think I have exactly that, but I certainly have things of that tenor and that nature in my research that have that that flavor or that mood that you're describing. So, but I can't I don't think I have a, one where the owl will actually make a different noise. I've certainly had weird things where people will say, like I saw a bright lemon colored owl, like lemon yellow, like the normal owl, but it was like totally electric lemon colored, like like bright wow. yellow. So, so there's, yes. So there are these weird things that show up in the literature. And I also get a lot of other bird stories and I, and I talk about some of the bird stories. I'm kind of, for the books, I'm sticking straight with the owls, but I certainly have a, collected a lot of stories with other birds. So I, um, especially around death, owl, birds and around death seem to, seem to show up. So really? yeah. Oh, lots. And it's the owls in particular. There's a, uh, a fellow named Dr. Peter Fenwick and he's a, um, I think he was like a, he was a he is a brain surgeon in uh, England, and he's written him and his wife have written some books, and he's getting older now, and so he's I think he's got permission just by the fact that no one's going to give him a hard time anymore that he's been including a lot of very mystical stories in his in what would be he studied a lot of death you know, what happens to people at the time of their death, and he began collecting these bird stories these owl stories which are which I have many, many dozens in my files that all play out exactly the same word. Owl will usually will show up after a death, usually the death of a parent, a loved one. Hmm. And those are, I can tell you a few if you want, but those, those well, are. Yeah, share at least one of them with us. Uh, oh, here, I'll share one. This happened to me. So when my, so I'm going to, my, uh, my mother died in 2013. And my sister was on one side of the bed and I was on the other side and we were holding her hand when it happened. And my mother had been ill for a long time and she had been unconscious for many days at that point when we were sitting by her bedside in the hospice care unit at a, at a assisted living facility. So it was really like a powerful touching moment for me and my sister. And my brother was not in the room, but he was nearby. So, um, and that happened at like three in the morning and the next day we were totally we couldn't sleep. We were trying to deal with stuff and we were all like, you know, just, it was a, it was a complicated day, you know, emotions and everything. Sure. So that night we're at my sister's house. My mother lived very close to my sister and we're at my sister's house and we're on the back porch and my sister's good friend, Ruthie was there. Now my brother and sister both knew of my owl research, but they had no idea what to make of it. So I'm sitting on a kind of big, big couch thing in their back deck, my sister's back deck. And my brother's on one side, my sister's on the other. And her friend is across from her. And she said, she's very Southern. She's, this is North Carolina. And she's very proper. And she says, Mike, I know that there is an afterlife. 
because I know from an experience I had with an owl. Now, when, mm. when she said owl, both my sister literally did the thing where she went, oh, oh no, no, no. What? Oh, like, like this is Mike's crazy thing, you know? Uh -huh. And my brother gave me this look like, like, like I put Ruthie up to this or something like that. He gave me this funny look and I was like, like she saw it, Ruthie saw it. And she was like, what did I say? What did I say? And I'm like, Ruthie, like, like you don't know this, but I've been doing research about owls and how they show up in highly charged human events. That's kind of a catchphrase I use. I don't know if I mm. said it that night, but how they show up in people's lives, often around the time of death, often around like powerful events. I don't know if I said UFOs. I might've said, including UFOs, but I said, I want to hear your story. And she said, I was the neighborhood where my sister lives. There's this nature trail around the neighborhood. It's really pretty. So you can walk the dogs and stuff there. And she said she was going out every day onto the nature trail after her father died to deal with her grief. And there came a day, well, excuse me, every day she was passing this owl on a branch. Uh -huh. And there came a day where she stopped in front of the owl on the branch and said, owls shouldn't come out during the day. Owls only come out at night. Mm -hmm. And she's from the South and she said, are you my daddy? And she said she felt this like complete relief of her grieving, just melted away. And the owl oh, flew off. Goodness. And the owl flew off and and she she never saw the owl again. I have so that one includes me. Like I was right there when she told that story at a at like a very powerful moment when I well, I would say when I needed to hear it for my own solace, and I think where my brother and sister needed to hear it so that they wouldn't so they so they would realize that my research was valid because I think they just thought I was, had lost my mind. So, um, so yeah, that, so that is a very powerful personal story for me. And I have had, I have that story in one form or another, I don't know, many, many dozens of times. And I'm, and if I was specifically asking for that story, I'm sure there's lots, lots more. Oh yeah. Yeah. You, I, I'll bet you get, all kinds of email after you do a, a show like this uh, where people uh, that haven't heard yep. about this before will it'll trigger and say, Oh my gosh, this thing happened. There was another thing that happened just a few years ago with our friend, uh, Jean Walker. She and I are mm -hmm. investigators and we, we worked on a case. Uh, in fact, it's an ongoing case in Sugar Creek, Missouri. And at one point, uh, during one of the investigations, I was I was not in attendance at that one, but there were several investigators. And they all noticed this big owl in a tree, and they they just very slowly approached it. It sat there and sat there, stayed there. It was during the day or late afternoon, and they were just commenting on how big it was that it was bigger than a normal owl. Well, Jean managed to get a series of pictures of it starting from far away and then actually gradually approached. She said she got about 10 feet away and then it, it flew off. When then she went back and reviewed the photos, there's no owl in any mm -hmm. picture. What do you think that is? See, this is the problem, isn't it? Like we're dealing with something genuinely mysterious. Like I could guess yeah. what the problem is. I don't know what, I mean, this is like, this is, it's honestly, you know what that sounds like? That sounds like, like a, like a scene from the X Files, right? So the scriptwriter oh, writes it. Oh, I'm going to write something spooky that's going to be dramatic, and then yeah. it shows up in in fiction. So you have a situation where it's something spooky and dramatic shows up in real life. Like I think that there's like myth makers. That's a term I use sometimes. Myth makers at play, kind of seeding these events. Like so, you were at the site of a UFO investigation with a bunch of UFO investigators. Yeah. They, I think they were just presented with a like a like a wow moment for just so that they could recognize the 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 crazy power that's imbued and folded into this entire subject. You know, it's I was at the conference. She told me that story directly, and I was at mm -hmm. that conference in in Arkansas, and there were other investigators that were there. Mm -hmm. All of them told the story a little bit different. It was like it was like. They were all just like a little bit perplexed and it was 
like they almost couldn't keep track of the weirdness of it. So I talked to, I think three separate people and yeah. they all essentially told the same story, but it was just mixed up enough that I, that in a way I trusted it more after talking to all three of them because it was so um, off kilter in a way. Yeah. If that makes sense. Well, that location. And in fact, the woman herself, even she's moved to another place in the same town she still has ongoing events, mm -hmm. but she has just extremely bizarre things happening at both places. And whenever we go out to her site, we witness something. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just guaranteed that something is going to happen there. Uh, but, you know, of course, the owl, the disappearing owl is, is a big part of that. I had another case, and this is in Oklahoma. I, I'm helping on this investigation. Uh, Mindy Toutfest is the director of Oklahoma MUFON, and she it, she's the lead investigator on this case. She, at one point, went out with several investigators, and they left the site because nothing was happening. They'd been out there for a long, long time, nothing, and they're just getting ready to pack up and go home, so they head down a hill. When this gigantic crane, a large crane, came over their heads, and swooped down, and they just thought it was a regular bird, and it disappeared in thin air. It just vanished. Mm -hmm. So here is another case where they think they're really looking at an actual real crane, and then it disappears. And they still are dumbfounded by this experience. Uh, they, what do you think the messages? I mean, are they wanting us to pay more attention to what we're looking at. What do you think the motive is? Wow. Um, so, so like, I'm not off the top of my head. Like, I don't know the totem meaning of a crane, like a, like a sandhill crane. Um, but I, um, so UFO investigators leaving a site of a, of a, of a you know, of an ongoing investigation, mm -hmm. seeing a crane that disappears that's remarkably similar to UFO investigators at the site of a UFO investigation where they see an owl, but it disappears when it goes onto the camera, if that makes sense. I mean, it's, they're very similar in their tone. And I honestly, like I'm at the point now where I think that the, that the, you know, like the grand chess player, you know, like, I feel like we're like, if reality, if like all of our experiences are on this flat chess board and we're like, you know, these two people get put together and there's a couple of investigators and they go to this site and you move the, the pieces on the board around, like there's this grand chess player that's just like, I'm going to mess with this. I'm going to like, I'm going to poke, I'm going to poke yeah. this thing and I'm going to, I'm going to create some sort of static or I'm going to create some sort of sense of wonder or I'm going to create some sense of fear or some sense of awe. I think this is being done on purpose. I don't know the reason why, but that's certainly my sense after having just like heard and talked to so many people who have had exactly the kinds of experiences that you just described. Yeah. Do you think these types of experiences are on the rise or do you think people are just deciding to come forward and discuss it now since it's not so taboo as it used to be? It's the, my, my, you know, my, um, I think that this is maybe on the rise a little bit, but I certainly sense, yes, we're in a different era where people are feel open to talking about this in a way that they might not have even a decade ago. Turn the clock back 30 years ago, nobody would have mentioned this or they would have been very, very cautious to mention this. And um, I would also say that I am certain that these same things were happening all throughout human history. Like there's a rich myth mythology of owls and birds and cranes and other animals and totem animals. I am certain these things have been happening all throughout human history. And that's where we get our mythology about owls or about cranes sure. or about hawks or about eagles or about hummingbirds or deer or fox. I mean, there all of these things I've all of I've had all of these things show up in my UFO reports, you know, the type of reports that I'm getting. And my sense is that. These are all mythic animals with a rich lineage of, of folklore. And I'm certain that, you know, you know, in ancient Greece with their togas, you know, would have seen 
the same had the same experience that the UFO investigator had when the crane disappeared. And from that, they would have told a story and that sto story would have been retold and someone mm -hmm. else would have built on that story from their own experience. And that story would slowly have seeped into our unconscious and our collective psyche for a reason, because those events are real and the, and the, and the myth and the folklore rose out of those real accounts all throughout human history. It makes me believe that we should perhaps be paying more attention to Native American traditions and, and stories and the, the totem animals because that it feels real yeah. it, it, after you have an experience like that you've got to rethink your reality uh and i i think i'm just of the opinion that we're in a big reality shift right now that more people are awakening more people are raising their consciousness and they're you know, it's a different vibratory rate, if you will. Uh, and, you know, it's such as telepathic contact with, with ETs that, that is happening. Um, and, and this is a big part of it. It's becoming aware of and, and having an experience like this. It, it just, uh, it, to me, it just turns something on. It, it clicks in the mind. Uh, that, yeah, there's more to life than nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. And there's no, you know, we, we need to be left brain and right brain. And we need to be balanced. And I, I think that that's probably one of the biggest messages that these entities are giving us is to balance our brain. Because if you're totally left brain, there's no way you can understand what's going on here. And, and, and or go beyond that. Unless you unless you you factor in that reality may not function the way we think it does. So totally left brain people are doing, you know, research into quantum physics. Now I don't know what quantum physics really means. I mean, just using that as an example. But you know, so totally left brain people are are looking into quantum physics. Totally left brain people sit up at night and watch, you know, ghost movies. So they're 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 capable of like looking at it in the form of fiction, once it shows up in real life, then they're a little more, they're, they're a little more skeptical. But, um, so, but I get exactly what you mean. Yeah. We're, we're in a different era and whether, um, and I'm, so my, someone asked me, um, like, how, how's my life changed since I started doing this all research? And I had to think for a little bit. And I said, I now live in a magical universe. Because I've like I recognize that like I'm getting story after story after story that just implies that there's this deeper reality, that there's this more complex interface between our consciousness and the fabric of, of what of what makes up our day-to-day -day reality. You mentioned some of the uh, scenarios where owls show up. Do they ever are they ever uh, considered connected to healing, for instance? Wow, that's it. So yes, the answer is yes, 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 with a great big giant electric. Yeah, that's like the, that's where my research has been kind of funneled. So there's a few things. This is, so when I talk to people, I talk to people all the time. They say, oh, I had this owl experience and they send me an email and they give me their phone number and they said, let's talk. And it's like, I get a lot of letters and it's hard to talk to everyone, but sometimes I talk to folks. And when I do, I have a clipboard and I write down stuff and I just write down simple stuff like their phone number and the date and like how old they are and a little bit of their story. And it's not like I'm keeping complex notes, but on the edge of that paper, I write Reiki. I write it on every piece of paper. Every time I, I write it before, like right when I make the phone mm. call, I write Reiki in the corner and I just wait. And so these are people who have had owl experiences in combination with UFO experience. So those two things together <laughs> okay. and I just wait. And then I kind of like, oh, so what are you doing? What do you do for work? And I'm like, oh, I'm a Reiki master. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what's been going on in your life lately? And it's like, oh, I just got my level three Reiki uh, a certificate. And, and then if they're not doing Reiki, then I get to the end of the call and I'm like, listen, I got to ask, do you do any like hands-on healing? And they said, well, not really. Except when my, when my wife was going through chemotherapy, I'd be able to hover my hands over her body and alleviate her pain. Mm -hmm. So, so how do, like, how do I, like, <laughs> how do I yeah. research this? Like, like it's, it's not a hundred percent, but wow. Of the people who contact me, I will tell you, like, like, the people who contact me with an owl in your story are Reiki healers. 
like the okay. general population. It's not 70%. No. Like, you know, like that's yeah. a, that is, and I, I'm doing that anecdotally off the top of my head. It's pretty high. I don't know exactly what it would be, but yeah, like what a weird little statistical anomaly that that's, is. Well, you can put me on the list. Because okay, I, I was do, I wasn't I even bothering it. asking. I could yeah, just say once you said you were doing work. remote healing, I was like, well, you're yeah. probably there's a whole bunch of things in the checklist that I can assume just given that. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh this is synchronistic to me. Uh, you know, I, I feel I feel a connection, definitely. When somebody sees, let's say I'm gonna show this, if they see an elk flying directly at them. Does that have a particular meaning? You know, I mean, it's the meanings in the eye of the observer. So I was, you know, like I'm actually into, so like sometimes people send me a story and they say, oh, you know, I was like in my backyard and there was an owl on a fence post. Wow, it was really a great sighting. Owls are really beautiful. And I'm like, okay, that that doesn't make it in the my big file. <laughs> that doesn't make it in the file cabinet. That's a very nice story. And, but, um, I've had a lot of stories of, so for me, when, like I've made a plea, I said, I'm not going to pay attention to owls unless they cross my path, mm. you know? So that's to me, like, that's, you know, like crossing your path is a little verbal metaphor. So, but a flying owl flying right at you, you know what I've got a lot of reports of? I got a lot of reports of owls hitting windshields hmm. and, and then they, the driver stops the car, like, bam, like it hit the heart, bam, it hit hard enough that the owl should be dead. And then they go out and they walk around and there's no owl, there's no feathers, there's no blood. So I, I have a story. This is a story I wow. like. This woman, this is in Australia, and she was driving at night and her husband was driving. And she was kind of nodding off. She was in that little magic point in the, in the, like between sleep and wake. She was in the passenger seat. And she has all kinds of weird experiences in her life, like psychic experiences. And, and, um, but she was doing, um, UFO watches, but she wouldn't, had never seen a UFO, but she had done a lot of paranormal work and she felt she was pretty savvy with her paranormal work. And she, she said kind of as she was drifting off to sleep and her husband's driving at night, she said, I, I've been doing a lot of hard work with this UFO stuff. I've been going to these night watches. I've been putting out a lot of intention I'm ready to see you. I'm ready to see the UFO occupants. And she heard a voice in her head said, you're not ready to see us. We don't want to frighten you. Oh. <laughs> and she said, frighten me as if anything could frighten me. And then at that moment, bam, an owl hit the windshield. Like right as she said, like as if anything could frighten me. And then bam. And both her and her husband, ah, they freak out and they're totally, their hearts are pounding and their adrenaline's running and they get out of the car in this lonely road and they walk around and they, there's no owl, there's no blood, there's no feathers. So like back engineer that one. What took place? Wow. I have, wow. I have that one in, in one form or another, a lot. The owl that was, in the windshield. That, that sounds like a big pay attention right now moment. The whole, every owl yeah. sighting is a big pay attention moment in my opinion, or like every owl that's interwoven into you know, that has a highly charged connection to it, let's say. My husband and I have been talking about birds and some of the birds that I had been seeing, um, hawks in particular, and owls. And later that day, he went out to go fishing at Lake Jacomo. He came back and he said, he was driving on the road, you know, because it's like 20 miles an hour there. And there on the side of the road, in the road, was a dead bird. And he went over to it, and it there was no blood. There were no feathers anywhere. No cuts on the animal, but it was, it was dead. He picked it up, and he brought it back because we had just been talking about about this, the strange bird sightings and what they meant. And I had been talking to a friend of mine who's a native American and she was telling me about what some of these things meant. Like if you, if you see a hawk and it's looking in a certain direction and it keeps appearing and doing that, that you're supposed to look in that direction and pay attention to it. So anyway, um, that was just one of the things he brought it back and he, he said, he said, I don't know what this is. And, I looked at the face. I said, oh my gosh, that's a great horned owl. It was, it was a huge owl, but it was in perfect 
condition. Do you have any stories like that? Is anybody telling you that they're, that they're finding something like this? I had one woman say she found 10 owls in a row on the side of the road <gasps> on the way. And she was on the way to, Oh, there's an annual event. I think in Arizona, like a, like a native American, something called earth convention or something. I can't remember what it was called, but she was on her way to a, uh, like a, a convention where native Americans were going to be speaking about spirituality. So yeah, 10 owls in a row. So, and then, yeah. and then I, 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 um, I had my own story where I was driving down the side of the road and I found an owl on the, just like that. And it was kind of beat up. It looked like it'd been out there for a couple of days and it was, and it was a great horned owl. And I, I, I carried it off the road a little bit and I said, I'm going to take a feather. And I asked its permission. Can I take a feather? And I felt nothing at all, nothing at all. And I pulled out one wing feather, it took a lot of work to get it out. And I kind of walked away and I took about three steps away from this bird. And I felt this like, oh, like, holy crap. Like, what did I do? And I was like, oh, and I hit this. It was strong. It was like, bam. I was like, oh my God, I shouldn't have done that. And I turned wow. around and I carried the owl off. And this is like, it was like a cold day in Wyoming. And it was like, it wasn't winter yet, but Wyoming can be windy and cold even when it's, so it was like an autumn. And I, so I went back and I dug the tiniest little hole and I put it under a sagebrush. There really wasn't much I could do. And I buried it and left the feather there. But that, that feeling was palpable. Like, don't you dare take that feather was basically the message I got. So, so, so wow. yeah, I've got a lot of stories about people finding, well, dead owls on the side of the road is actually not too uncommon in real life because owls do get hit by cars quite often. So. Yeah. Well, that was, a, that was a first for him. And, and the next day, the same thing happened only it was a hawk and it was in the exact same place. How interesting. Okay. So, so, so the hawk and the owl, so the, you know, the, the owl is the hawk of the night and the hawk is the owl of the day. They mirror each other. So, um, mm. the, the hawk is a, is like an outward totem, right? So hawk and eagles are essentially the same. So Zeus has a, has a totem. I'm putting, he has a totem eagle that he has on his wrist and, and he's, he's masculine. He's like a conqueror. He stands on a mountaintop. He's like out in the bright sunshine and he's like, you know, so it's all these outward physical things. Now, Athena, the goddess of wisdom, has a tiny little owl on her wrist. And she's this, she's a feminine archetype. She's connected with the night. She's connected with like spirituality and magic. So you have these two opposing totems, right? So you have one that's like masculine and outward and, and daylight. And you have this other one that's smaller and much more subtle and a sign of night and the mysteries of the night. So that's, that's great. So I, I, so I got a lot of stories of owls on the side of the road. I'll tell you a quick one. This is one that came in. A guy um, had to go to work every morning. He, he waxed the floor at a grocery store, right? So he got up before the grocery store opened. He said, it's a great job All alone. It's an easy job. I wax the floor. I can listen to music. And then I'm done before the grocery store is open. So I, my day is done and I go back home. But every day he would go and stop his car in the nighttime, right? So it's before the sun comes up, he's waxing the floor. And it, he stopped his car at this little corner and there was a little field there and he'd stand at the field and he would go outside and basically say, I know there is more to this reality. I need a sign. He'd pray, essentially. I know there's more to this reality. Please give me a sign. And then there was a day when he was driving down the road and it was freezing cold out, like 20 below zero. This is in like New England somewhere. So it's like 20, 30 below zero. And he's driving and he's like, oh, it's too cold. I'm not getting out today. And as soon as he has that thought, there's this little thing. He thinks it's a paper bag on the road, a little crumpled up thing in the road. And he's driving along. And then the little thing stands up and looks at him as he's driving. He gets this close up. These, you know, he like sees this. It's an owl with a big owl eyes. And it, bam, he hits it. Ooh. And kills it. He certainly kills it. Stops his car, gets out of the car. Same thing. There's no dead owl. He was standing at the exact spot where he prayed every morning. Uh -huh. And like, he was like, oh, you're not going to pray? Too cold to pray? Well, we're going to get you out of the car. He got his message. He got out of the car. Yeah, he got out mm -hmm. of the car and prayed at his spot. Yeah. So like, wow, this is, so this is the flavor of the stories I'm collecting. Like that didn't have any UFO. In it. The power of, of, 
something mystical going on just behind the curtain of reality. Now you had, you wrote your first book in 2015, The Messengers. Mm -hmm. And then we have stories from The Messengers. Tell us a little bit about that. So when I wrote The Messengers, what happened was like, so you must know what I'm talking about. So you talk to someone and like, oh, well, let's hear about your UFO experiences. And like six hours later, you're like still in the thick of it. Like it's like nobody has a simple story about their UFO experience, right? It's like just goes on and on. Mm -hmm. So I felt terrible. Like someone would talk to me for six hours or more. And then I would have to sum it up in one sentence. You know, Joe saw an owl, you know, right around the same time he saw a UFO. That's all Joe gets. Where Joe actually has this like monstrously engrossing story. Mm -hmm. So I felt so bad that I couldn't do, I couldn't honor the people in their stories that I wrote the second book. And that has a collection. It's 19 stories, 19 chapters that read like a short story each. And, and, um, and each one is explores those complicated stories. And you must know what I mean, where you, where someone tells you a story and it's like, well, wait a minute, you pull on that thread and it, it's like connected to something over here and it's connected over here. And it's like, it, these stories are very complicated. So that was a tough one to write because I had to tell complicated stories in a linear way that the reader could understand. And that's the book where I, where all the healing stuff came out. And I was like, wow, every, it wasn't everyone in the book, but I'll tell you nearly every one of those people. And some stories have three or four people in them. Nearly everyone is doing some sort of healing work. Can you pick one of them out and give us a short synopsis of it? If there is such a thing. I'll give you one little short story out of it. Um, do you know a woman named Denise Lynn? She's been writing um, sort of self-help kind of books. She's a, she's a busy author. She's in kind of doing new thought stuff. She's out of California. She talks about a UFO sighting. She's seen owls. She's seen hawks. She writes really good books and it's really great talking to her because she's, um, she has a, she's done a whole book on animal totems and stuff like that. So really, mm. you know, and she's out there, she's writing books and she's got a lot of books and she gets interviewed on like a coast to coast and things like that. So she had native American blood and she had native American friends. And she was kind of said, like someone told her like, now is the time you need to go out and get your animal name, your spirit name. And she went into the woods and, um, said, okay, I'm going to go. She lived in Northern California and walked into the woods. And she said, I'm going to, I'm here specifically to get my, my totem name, my spirit name. And she sat down in the forest and closed her eyes. And she said, everything got eerily quiet. And this is, that's UFO stuff. Everything got eerily quiet. You know, mm -hmm. it's weird silence. And she closed her eyes and she asked formally, and when she opened her eyes, right in front of her, right in front of her on a branch was a great horned owl. And they locked eyes. And she said, she said she felt like she got a download, like, like a down. Let's let that again is a UFO thing. She got a download from this owl mm -hmm. and the owl flew off. And she, she heard a message in her mind that said, so the owl flew off and there were three little feathers on the branch where the owl was sitting. And she heard a voice in her said, in her mind that said, put the feathers in your medicine bag. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, I have a medicine, I have a nice medicine bag at home. It's in the shelf. It's on my, it's in my office on the shelf, my medicine bag. It's not here. And the voice said, you are your own medicine bag. Put the feathers in your medicine bag. And without a second thought, she picked up the three feathers and ate them. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, and I I'll tell that. you, and I'll tell you that like that one little point, like brought up so much stuff for, as far as like, as far as like, you know, what the meaning of like communion would be and Christianity. And it was so that, so her story I thought was really beautiful and funny that she had this powerful thing and she actually ended up eating the owl feathers and she's very much a healer. She does healing work and, and, and she's, a, I, I'm, if she's not a Reiki therapist, she's doing some sort of Reiki type healing. And she, so, so she's a healer. She takes people on retreats and things like that. So. Okay. That's, I would say one of the most bizarre stories I've ever oh, heard. Bizarre is I got the bizarre ones. Some of I, can't, the, I don't think I would interpret it that way. If I got that message, I would put them in my pocket. <laughs> she know, ate them. She I was her own medicine bag. Yeah. So yeah. She ate them. That's pretty wild. That's pretty wild. Now, 
you also have that, that goes back. There's all kinds of, of stuff in ancient Greek. Oh, oh, go on. Well, I was just going to say, we've got book number three that you told me earlier, hardly anyone knows about. So what is this one about? So that one is a memoir of my, um, of my, how to say this, like my acceptance of my own experiences. In 2009, I started a blog and Initially, I was just going to be a blog of synchronicities because I have a lot of them. Like I was just going to tell stories of synchronicities. And very early on, within the first few weeks, it was like, I got flooded. Like so many things that it was basically felt like I had, it was saying, you got to write about your UFO stuff. Like the, like the guardian angels were whacking me on the head saying like, you got to write about your UFO stuff. So I did. And it was, it was, um, I was writing about stuff in real time and, uh, and that's in the book. When I worked to the first two books, Richard Dolan published the first two books. And him and I would have long talks and I would tell him these stories. And he's like, he could hear, he would, he basically says, you, you got to do, you got to do your own memoir someday. You need to do that someday. And I, and after I finished the first two books, I sort of thought, and I said, well, I, I have my own memoir. It's like my blog posts, like it's all in there. It's all in my blog. And so rather than, rather than, um, rewriting something and say, well, 10, you know, five years ago, this happened. And it was a powerful experience in the, the blog. It's like my, it's like a blog post dated. And it says, this happened last night and I'm freaking out. So I have like a real time document of uh -huh. a lot of powerful experiences. And I, so I, I put those key documents, those key blog posts in the book and it reads like a long narrative. And what's happened is people who read that book who have never had like a UFO experience, they kind of get back to me and say, well, you know, I read it. I, I didn't get it, you know? And then people who have had direct UFO contact, what you call, call them abductees, let's say, they get back to me and they're like, oh my God, that book was so important to me. Thank you for saying everything that I felt. Like, thank mm -hmm. you for, for saying the stuff that I cannot say myself. You said it. So I've, I have since, like, I'm less worried about promoting that one. I figure it's going to hand up, it's going to end up in the, on the bookshelves of the people who need to read it, hopefully. Well, I think a lot of those people are watching this program. So uh, go check that out. They're available at uh, Amazon, correct? Mm -hmm. And your website as well. And they're all audiobooks okay. too, which I'm very, I read two of them. And then I had a voice actor read the first one, the big fat blue one, which is the longest one. So. Um, but yeah, I, I, I noticed that, that, uh, that's excellent. People really love audiobooks right now. That's a big deal. I, and I was happy to do them and yeah. it was fun to do them. Yeah. And then are they also on Kindle? Kindle print audiobooks. You can get them, uh, at your local bookstore, just ask and they can order them and, or you can get them through Amazon or audible. So, okay. And what is the web address for your blog? Well, the easiest way to find, so the easiest way to find me is to Google UFOs owls. And I'm the first thing that comes up and then I'm about the next 25 things come up. You don't have to know how to spell my last name to look me up. You can just, but if you, you can go to the easiest place to go is um, mikeclellan.com and that will link you to my blog. That And then if you want to type it all out, you can go to hiddenexperience.blogspot.com and that's the title of the blog. And, and honestly, I haven't been working so hard on the blog lately. But there's, if you scroll back, there's over 16 years of posts on the blog at this point. That's a lot. Yeah. That's absolutely a lot. I've been thinking about doing the same thing uh, with mine, collecting the stories and uh, and putting them together. So, I, you know, I'm, I think that's a great idea. Got, we've got a few more minutes here. I wanted to ask you about uh, if anybody sees two owls at once like this, what what do you think that means? Or has has anybody actually said that? Oh, oh gosh, yeah. Two owls, three owls, five owls. Yeah, I got, I got lots of owl stories where there's lots, where there's more than one owl. Um, you know, honestly, it feels like, you know, you just hit the exclamation point twice for more emphasis sometimes. So um, I have a story of a woman um, this is in the first book and her name is Susan Kornacki. And this is connected to us. Oh my, to tell this, this is the problem to tell this story correctly. So she's an experiencer. She's been very upfront with her UFO contact experiences. She. 
and she had to leave. But like, oh my God, I, like, I feel like this electric charge in me. I'm just freaking out. I feel like I'm like, like, like this electric charge is running up and down throughout my body. So she goes home and her husband's still at the party and she lies on her hammock in the backyard. The hammock is tied between two trees, right? So she's in the middle of the hammock and she's like, something's up, something's up. I don't feel right. And then an owl lands on one tree where her foot is. And then the other owl lands on the other side where her head is. And these two owls start hooting at each other. And she feels like these waves of energy going back and forth between her. And I can't like, like if you've took a little component on a circuit board, like and plugged it in, that would be Susan Kordaki. And then you'd plug in a little owl component on one end and a little owl component on the other end. They'd be zapping somehow and recharging her. And she said, she said, I felt like I was being rebalanced. And I was like, what happened after this? She said, well, I started doing hands-on energy healing work. <laughs> so it feels oh. like I mean, did the owls like zap her? Yeah. Like, okay, we're gonna like you need to be recharged. So, so yeah, there's two owls, and and yeah. that story to tell it correctly, they just connected to so much. Like, that's a problem. It's tough. People say, well, tell me a quick story. And I'm like, oh, the quick there stories are quick. tough, right? Yeah. Well, you know, th that's odd that you mentioned the hooting because when I go outside at night, I I know if owls are in the area and then pretty soon, a few minutes later, they'll, they'll start hooting back mm -hmm. and forth. And I've gotten to the point where there's three individuals and I recognize their hoots because they're each different. And, and it's, it is a kind of a, I don't want to say a piercing tone, but you can feel it in your body. You can feel the vibration. Oh yeah. Of Do you that. know if they're barred owls? No, I, do, I don't. Okay, you I could go online that. and listen to the owl calls. It's really easy to listen to, but barred owls have a super strong, loud call. Like, really. Oh, these like, do. Yeah. These do. Yeah. Uh, and we're we're next to a railroad cut where there's a lot of woods, and there are a lot of animals yeah. hanging out in that area right behind our house, even though we're in the, the city. You know, we've got some woods there. and and But the, the thing is, like I said, I know they're there before they make any sound. Mm -hmm. I can I can feel their presence coming from a certain distance away. I want to say a mile away is when they start, and then they always come in closer and closer and closer to me. And there'll be the three of them around. They'll be right in my yard. Wow! Have uh, you ever seen them? I've on occasion just seen the outline of them in the night, you know, with the moonlight or something. But I've never seen close up uh okay. I, yeah what is so that you're mean? a psychic right you're yeah doing psychic work okay oh, yeah. so my, i would argue that back in ancient babylonia there would be a psychic in the village and the psychic would have the same experience that the owls would three owls i'm just I'm, i have no way to prove this but my sense is that you are not alone the same experience has been happening all throughout human history so and it's happening now to you, to me, to the people who write into me. And I'm certain this is not anything new, that these, that this is the source of these, where the mythology comes from, where the folklore comes from. You know, why, why someone would say, oh, the animal totem of the owl is this, this second sight, this ability to travel to the land, to another realm, and then return with a message. I'll tell you what, Mike, I could talk to you for hours and hours, but unfortunately we are out of time for today. But thank you so much for being on the program. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my honor. I loved every minute. And I hope you'll come back sometime. Anytime. <laughs> All right, great. This is Margie Kay with Unex News, and I hope you'll join me here again next Friday at 5 p.m. You've been listening to the Unex News Podcast with Margie Kay. Any rebroadcast or duplication of this program or its content without express written permission from Unex Media or Margie Kay herself is strictly prohibited. The Unex News Podcast, in direct cooperation with the internet website, unexmedia.com.